Do you think you can give a proper high five with your tiny hands? Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we're talking about queerness. The first of probably over the course of season several podcasts, but you know, we just sort of get it underway. Mm-hmm. And the icebreaker for today, we're still in, we're, we're broadcasting from the past, from Scotland, uh, with Theo. Uh, is your, what is, what is your, uh, or uh, an important piece of queer media to you? Theo. My one I'm going to talk about is, um, is Ashley Mardell's YouTube channel. Ooh. They are a non-binary... <laughs> the non- link is in the show notes. Yeah, That's I my point. It's just a little blink. It was great. I just like that you forgot about the audio people. You're pointing down below and the audio people... The audio people know where the show notes are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are a non-binary um, pansexual individual who does... Um, like a channel, they have a thing called ABCs of LGBT. Ooh. So they kind of do a little series talking with other YouTubers about sort of different aspects of LGBT stuff. They do slam poetry. Sweet. Which is super rad. Um, and yeah, like just a lot of the stuff they talk about is, it's a lot of it is very centered around being queer. The whole channel is kind of centered around being queer and mm-hmm. different aspects of being queer. But it's presented in a really easy way to watch. It's really digestible and a really approachable way. And kind of like. It's very informative as well. Like, I've learned stuff watching it. I thought I knew and didn't realize it. And I didn't know. But yeah. Links in the show. Yeah, it's my favorite. Fuck. So, our pre show was a mess in terms of <laughs> me being productive because I am the straight man. Yeah. And in Scotland, for certain uh, experiences, I was the straight man. Quite literally. Yeah, the, the only straight man. Yeah. So so obviously uh, a, a podcast about queerness was going to be unique for me being somebody whose experience has never been something internal to myself, I guess I could, to, to phrase it. Like it's always been something that has happened to other people and it's important to me because those people are important to me. Mm-hmm. So um, – I was initially hesitant to, to go along with this podcast, only insofar as I didn't think I would have anything meaningful to say. Um, <laughs> oh, so cute. But um, I wanted to, to do, do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that all prefaces the, 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 the pre-show when they're like, okay, Huck, what's your favorite piece of queer media? And it's like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, because I don't really watch media i don't i don't select media on on any kind of basis of of who made it in that regard um obviously that is part of my privilege that um i can to a certain degree ignore that dimension well i can i have the ability to um so it was really difficult for me to come up with something so in the end i'm going to steal one of jim's Mm -hmm. uh and i'm going to say the first matrix movie Sweet. I didn't really didn't really care much for the second and third one. The second one was all right. The third one, I just as a movie, I didn't really enjoy it. But I really enjoyed the hell out of the first movie, and I would still pick it up and watch it now, even though I've seen it many, many times. Um, and I would say it's important to me in this regard um, because it was the first time that something that I really, really liked um, th- was then bound up in the queer community and it forced me to, to kind of think about how I think or how it forced me to to think about how I thought about things um and so like it was I think it was probably my first experience with with uh relearning pronouns after the fact you know because for the longest time it was the Wachowski brothers and it rolled off the tongue and it was the first time you had to stop and be like oh wait no no that's not it's siblings now and then it just became easier now I guess it's the sisters, but the Wachowskis. Yeah, so the Wachowskis. But it's the oh, first time. <laughs> but it's the first time that something like that was was something that I was exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to think that there was no resistance in my mind. Like, I, it's not that I ever had to to think about it that way. It was just more along the lines of relearning something to to make sure it accords with reality. And that I wasn't misrepresenting something. So yeah. so that that would be why it was, it's, it's important for me. But I just like it as a movie. I thought it was a great movie. It is a good movie. Um, I, I recommend the next time you're surfing around on Netflix, um, watch The Matrix. And with, with, the, with the mindset that Neo is uh, coming out as trans and joining the queer community. Like, like 
think of think about that for a minute and go into it with that mindset and so, the, the the position of people like Morpheus and Trinity uh, and the agents and the Oracle start shifting dramatically in really interesting symbolic ways. Mm -hmm. Like like it is clear that the Wachowskis are 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 producing movies about coming out well before either of them came out. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I find really intriguing. Uh, oh, I guess it's me, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. your turn. So mine, uh, mine is uh, wonderfully problematic, uh, and I watched this way like long, long, long time ago. I would have been like sixteen when I saw it. Yeah, um, and I knew about it before that, but I didn't really. Um, sort of get what it was about and it was partly because like uh, it was a comedy movie um, and it was uh, Tu Wong Fu thanks for everything Julie Newmar Patrick Swayze and Wesley Snipes and John Leguizamo as um, dra drag queens on a road trip and it was one of those things where even when I watched it like I was I was you know I hadn't come out I didn't, I didn't really thought about it too much and I, I was I was you know rooming with a whole bunch of like super cishet bro dudes well nerd bros but still and but it was a really good movie and it spoke to a bunch of part there there are, there are a bunch of parts of that um, that really sort of speak to me and, and and the way that they are fierce um, is something I find really fascinating but it did not occur to me until I came out that I'm like oh Patrick Swayze and Wesley Snipes' characters are a couple. <laughs> like, like, that is, they're clearly a couple. Oh, dear. And there's clearly, like, a whole layer of subtext in the, the, the sort of weird love triangle that's going on between the three of them that I did not... <laughs> ever pick up on isn't it amazing going back now and like oh why was i so daft and see that yeah I and, and it's but it's, it's also it's it's a movie that um despite the fact that it cast three straight dudes as uh um queer men uh, and they are men they're drag queens um they make that very clear it tries to tackle i think honestly a lot of issues around stigma um in a sort of wishy-washy wonderful life kind of way but um it deals really interestingly with notions of allies becoming accomplices uh where it isn't just the three of them left to fend for themselves there's the the women in this town who um assert their own ferocity and and you know stand with them and that i think is really interesting that these 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 women are putting themselves at risk in the same kinds of ways especially in the context of the film um i recommend watching it also it's really funny um and it's really funny without doing i think a lot of those sort of classic um you know catfishing drag queen jokes it definitely does one of them because it's it's a central plot point of the movie um but it does it, it, it like it tries to play it play it off very seriously and it seems like like all of the actors involved are taking it really seriously too like patrick swayze is super into that <laughs> I love Patrick Swayze. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, uh, our topics for today, and we figured that it would it would probably run a bit long um, with three topics. But uh, is, the is the first is what what is it like being queer? And I'm gonna put the pressure on you, Huck, because I want you to go first. I want you. What is your imagining of what that is? like even in in sort of first impressions so i can't think back to the first impressions um it's kind of so so long ago and uh, me as a person has come a ways mm -hmm. um so 
But, I mean, you're, you're first imagining even now, if you had to imagine what it was like. So, and this is entirely based on things that I'm pie- piercing, piercing, piecing together from things that either my friends have said or things that they've linked to online. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first impression would probably be incredibly isolated mm-hmm. and then that driving a desire to seek out people like me to know that I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I only say that because of I'm um, gesturing over there where we had the physical conversation. But the <laughs> idea that um, when I consume when I consume media and everything else, um, the people or people involved in the project, whether or not they're queer, is not something that I kind of filter for. I don't seek it out explicitly. Um, having said that, I also recognize that you. That I, I, I can understand why a person would want to seek that out, why representation is so important, mm-hmm. why not erasing people is so important. I, I understand the reason. I don't feel that. Like, I, I, I don't feel threatened in that regard. The closest I would come to is, like, you know, the majority feeling like it's being erased, even though it's not. But, you know, like, like there might be that element of it, but I've never, I've never really felt yeah. erased or silenced or anything in that regard. Um, and so I would, based on everybody else's experiences that I've kind of absorbed, that would be, I think, the, the bit of it. Like, I don't have to seek out other people that are like me because everybody walks around. And as you kind of cheekily put it, like, I have a bad sense of gaydar. The, clo- <laughs> the, closest, the closest I might come is, like... Kyle and his lisp, <laughs> or not? Kyle does not have a lisp. Sorry, not the lisp, but the, the, the gay, the gay um, tone, the gay oh, intonation. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You know, like that, that. We'll put a link in the show notes to uh, the documentary. Yeah. Do I sound gay? Yeah, mm. which was which was oh, the the which... conversation that spurred on the way yes. back when the reference that we're talking about. Like <sighs> that might be something, but like I don't I don't pick up on the coded cues like Batman and Robin and Joel Schumacher stuff. <laughs> It was it was mind blowing to find out a lot of that stuff was coded gay because I have no experience in gay subculture, well, gay male subculture, and mm-hmm. that even that that's like a subculture of a subculture, right? Yeah. I don't pick up on those cues. I'm not sensitive to those cues, mm-hmm. so I don't pick up on it. And like gaydar is largely just based on being sensitive to identifying those cues. So a lot of times I find myself surprised that somebody is queer because it's not something that i'm filtering for i'm filtering for a lot of other different kinds of information it's just n- not there's something. a there's a meme that i saw it was something from tumblr i'll see if i can dig it up um and link to it in the show notes but um it had to do with gaydar and it was the notion that for gay people or for queer people gaydar is doesn't just let you detect other queer people it lets you um sort of you know detect things like safe spaces mm-hmm. or hostile spaces yeah like it it does it does this laundry list of other things and straight people are just like yeah it helps you find other queer people and we're like sure cool. <laughs> yeah i remember um, that meme now that you mention it yeah i'll see if i can take it out it was really it was it was really it really struck me because i'm like yeah it does sort of do all that stuff and i don't think about it that um see i, I slightly off topic like an actual radar box is a, like a box is a whole series of things. Because my sister taught me this because she's in the switches in the army. I always figured my gear was like this box. I could just flick a switch. Okay, today I want to find safe space. Today I want to find this. And I would like <laughs> do it. I'd like do it always in my head, like flick a little switch of what I was using my gear for that day. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. um, so for me, it's interesting that you that you talk about identification um, as, as being the thing. And I don't think you're entirely wrong either. Uh, I think that that is a, a, a really interesting conception. Um, for me... Uh, so I I am a um, cis uh, pansexual dude, and my queerness is bound up in anxiety. Like that is my first like go to, even in queer spaces, mm. because um, I am like the super stealth queer. <laughs> I am the stealth bomber of queer yeah. men. That's why, as you can tell, I wear black. It reflects gaydar. Oh, it, that's what you've been it doing. Absorbs it. I see. But no, in in the, in the sense that 
Uh, like I came out years ago, and essentially no one had any idea. Uh, and I have, um, you know, periodically since then, people forget, <laughs> or they, um, like, admittedly I didn't I didn't like throw a party or like do a Facebook announcement or anything, but they they like never they missed the memo. We can I can speak to this like we we can go ahead and like not shame me. But you were not the one that I that brings to mind yeah. when that happened. But, but yes, but yeah, like there was one time Jim essentially outed himself by telling a story about somebody else, and in my brain did a f- like a like it was like the the, the record <laughs> skipped, and it's just like Jim's queer. Should I know this processing kind of deal? And it's just like and then it's like okay. Do your best not to let your face change, so it's not so you're not acting surprised that this is a thing. Like that that happened. You were telling the story about like uh, there are three queer men in this. this yeah, in, in my apartment. And you're, like, and, like, and you're like three, and and I'm in my mind. I'm like, wait, what? What's going on here? Because yeah. uh, and, and like again, like this is this is uh, just sorry to to turn yeah. it back on myself. Like like Jim's queerness doesn't really affect me. Like in that regard like jim jim's personal life like there are elements of jim's personal life that are completely uh separate from the relationship that he and i have it's not something that comes up <laughs> so i never thought about it i never was exposed to it and then so yeah he he outed himself to me and i did my best to keep a poker <laughs> face to make it seem like i wasn't surprised by this i had no idea I, um I, I thought you already knew i thought everybody knew i thought we talked about it in podcasts before and we you know what we might have and it might have just been again it's I, I assume everybody like me is like me, and I just yeah. conveniently forget. Well, things. well, that's and that's the thing too is that that um, when I when I'm in queer spaces, I'm I'm masculine presenting. I'm a I'm a six foot tall white dude, um, so I'm anxious. I I'm often anxious in queer spaces because I feel that I'm not queer enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not involved in queer activism. I'm not, or scholarship. I am not, you know, especially because I know lots of people who are involved in in that kind of thing. And, like, that is a a source of worry for me, uh, especially because as a six-foot-tall white dude, I'm a big, loud six-foot-tall white dude. Like, I take up a lot of space physically. Thank you. I take up a lot of space vocally. And is a thing that I, I sort of, especially in, in the context of performance and things like that, I try to be aware of so that I can take steps back and leave space for people. Um, but it does not often leave space to ever talk about uh, my queerness, and that is a thing I do not often make space for. So yeah, like, queerness for me is bound up in anxiety in that sense, but also in the sense of being queer around straight people. Uh, and what that means for me personally in terms of risk Mm -hmm. uh professionally Mm -hmm. in terms of risk it's never come up in a workplace but i don't know about all the times it hasn't come up you know it's one of those things where uh somebody asked me once when i was working in a convenience store he was like how many people do you think come in here to to rob this place see a big dude standing behind the counter and change their minds and i'm like i don't know but i prefer not to think about it ever but like it, it is it is a thing that impacts I that I know impacts more facets of my life than I'm aware of, and things that do that worry me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my my queerness is is bound up in in fear and anxiety, um, which is probably not healthy. But uh, here we are. Mine, yeah. Mine mostly confusion. Hmm. Complete and utter confusion. Neat. Um, I am a pansexual trans guy. Um, I came out as pansexual... Well, I came out as queer (laughs) age 14. Um, I came out as pansexual age 19. And in the five years in between, I kind of wore sexualities as almost like there were different cults. Sure. Um, yeah, but you, might, you guys met my friend Alex the other day there, and he would tell you stories after stories after stories of me not knowing what my sexuality was, mm-hmm. going back and forward, um, being physically beat up at school because people had decided I was some sexuality they didn't like. Um, yeah, it was, uh, my, oh, me being a teenager was a mess. 
But I knew I was queer. I just didn't know in what way I was queer. And a lot of that came down to the fact that beyond sort of being told there are some gay people, there are some lesbian people, and I can't even people who are bisexual, we didn't get much more information than that. Like, mm-hmm. in school, like, sex ed and stuff in school. And this was, like, early 2000s internet. So there wasn't a lot of stuff that we could get access yeah. to falling around. There would be stuff there, but, like, when you're, you know, like, you know, at home's dial up, you get half an hour at night, you kind of, school computers are the only you can get to, and a lot of that stuff's blocked. So yeah. it's like, there wasn't a lot of information out there. Um, I only found out the term porn section because Alex's dad happened to mention it to him one day when, <laughs> this sounds like something that might fit lore, went and said to Alex, Alex came and said to me, I was like, oh my god, like, I just like, sort of the boom, brain blown moment of like, yes, that's the one, you know. Um, I didn't come out as trans until last year? Uh, I don't know. You were the first person I came out to, so I Okay, then yeah, last year. Yeah, last year. Um, yeah, but it took me like, two months to get up the courage to tell anyone. Um, but yeah, like for a long time, I, I mean, I, I'm going back to it. I can remember being a child and being like, there's something wrong with the way these people are treating me and the, people, these, the way these people are labeling me and defining me and the things I do and like the clothes I have to wear and like where I get changed for gym class at school. I was like, there's something very, I didn't know what was wrong. And I just assumed everyone felt that at times because again, mm. you, you don't get told about these things. And, yeah, it took me, I mean, there was a lot of bullshit repressed stuff going on in there, and, like, societal pressures and stuff, all of that, you know, the stuff you internalise, you don't mean to. And, eventually, yeah, I came out, I was non-binary, I could identify this for a while, and then I kind of settled on, like, <laughs> I, I say gender queer trans guy, because I still wear makeup and stuff, and that just to fuck with people, mostly, but, yeah, no, I, it was last year, so I was 20... Yeah, it's my 26th birthday, so I was 25 when I finally came out as trans. Mm-hmm. Which, people will tell you it's late for trans people. Some people know early. I'm like, it's not actually that late, though. I have a trans friend who didn't come out till she was 38. So, you know. But yeah, confusion, mostly. Not no, not having the information there, knowing, or knowing, like, being able to take what I was feeling, give it a context. Because, mm-hmm. like, people talk about dysphoria and things like that, and I didn't understand that what I was experiencing was dysphoria. Until I went and read all these people who had written their accounts of like what they felt and what they went through, so it took a lot of time to, a lot of a lot of not liking myself very much. But yeah. So talking about coming out, coming out, yeah. coming out was the other thing we we wanted to make sure that we talked about today. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to Huck. You had <laughs> mentioned in the pre-show that you'd sort of mentally linked, knowing that you were queer, and coming out as like the same sort of yeah thing. Um, which, uh, I think under the impression of every queer person you ever mentioned that to, which in my head is three, because the only times I've been around, uh, is a notion we find quaint. Yeah. (laughs) Adorable. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, um, what, what, what is, what, when, when we talk about coming out, what does that mean to you? Um, it's, I can really only talk about it in terms of when it's, yeah, like people coming out to me is um, just I don't know coming out to me um, redefining the relationship redefining the relation between people um, however that that gets cashed out um, but yeah um, I, I, don't, I don't know like do you have do you have a I, specific you're, you're wanting me to talk about? I don't know. So, so I think the thing I'm, I'm, that the that comes out to, or, or hits me immediately is the the notion that that, um, people sort of start being gay, or queer for you, when they come out. And I'm wondering if that's yeah. that's and that's where that that beginning. Well, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, I guess there's an element of. Um, they they feel more comfortable around me to be themselves mm-hmm. and uh, ostensibly like um, those like sorry queer I mean, presentations I mean, like being gay in your head yeah uh, well like yeah. that that is where that's that's where you get their identity yeah it's from the moment of them coming out to me mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know if I really like go back and recode the information before that it just it becomes ir- irrelevant I guess mm-hmm. or or it's a 
thing I remember, a series of events, but I don't really change it in my mind. You'll I'm... probably find after a while you sort of subconsciously start going, like going back, when you think back of that person, you just automatically start yeah. to find them. And it's probably just I don't necessarily... I don't think there's been a lot of people where I knew them long enough mm -hmm. uh, where they were closeted. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like I guess maybe that that's where that notion comes from of like, I don't know how long they've been closeted. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know when they, in some sense, came out to themselves and then came out to other people or came out to me, I guess, mm -hmm. is the most important thing yeah. in my narrative, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I kind of shorten that gap in my thinking. Like, I don't really think about it in terms of like, this person came out to themselves or this person, you know, found found a way of thinking about themselves that finally reconciled with the way they felt yeah. about themselves. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of division between thinking and feeling. Yeah. Um, that, because I don't, I don't experience that gap that usually just like there's, yeah. there's, you know, an infinitesimally small amount of time between the two, even though it could be vast swaths of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so one example I can think of, um, where I knew a person, uh, for some amount of time, three years or so I, I'd interacted with them and then that individual uh came out as trans mm -hmm. um and we've since then we've like the relationship kind of stalled I guess I don't know they moved away from where I am and so I don't I don't speak to them very often and you know like for one reason or whatever we don't ch talk online anymore um but I don't know I don't know enough about this person to understand like when from the point that they came out to me or at least when they were outed to me because uh, I don't even remember what the series of events happened like mm -hmm. how it happened but from the time that I found out and then go T minus and then go backwards from there I have no idea what that gap is I can't mm -hmm. appreciate when that happened what the circumstances were leading up to it um, and so for me it, it's a it's a in my mind, it just it, that distinction tends to be collapsed um, yeah. until I find out otherwise. Until I find out a little bit more of the context and history, and then I can understand and appreciate, you know, what that involves. But again, I don't, I don't live it. I don't have a, a firsthand experience of it. It's, it's mm -hmm. not something that's not my default, mm -hmm. and I guess that's, that's a fault of mine. But um, that's kind of where I sit. There is when I think come out. It, it, it. I do think about it in terms of coming out to yourself, even though clearly, if you're coming out to me, I'm not, yeah. I'm not the second person, and I'm not <laughs> I'm not the I'm not the isometric like it's not an experience of like me sitting there just be like, fuck, I'm gay, and then you overhear me saying that we discovered it. It's, <laughs> yeah. I know we've, that that's, we've come in this journey together. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I, I I know that that's not what is happening. Yeah, but. I, for some reason, have always just thought about it in terms of, like, oh, they came out. And it's, like, there's a sense of, like, coming out to yourself, coming out to other people. Yeah. And it just all collapses down into, into one experience. Yeah, no, you, there's no reason why you should be expected to, like, oh, I should have seen this years ago. And it's, like, that's nothing. Again, that's, like, comes down to the stereotypical sort of societal expectations of that thing and if you start applying that then it's just like that's a whole mess you need to borrow with. yeah and i have a i have a friend from hometown speaking of the gaydar experience again i have a friend <laughs> from hometown she's a lesbian and somebody told me that she was gay it was kind of one of those things of like well that makes sense i never thought about it but that, yeah. that makes sense that, that, that just seems perfectly in line with it. and then she seems to have, have this gaydar whenever we've gone out to the bar together and like you know like she's just like able to pick it and it's like are you picking out legitimate lesbians or like bisexual women that you have enough game that you'll pick them up? Because <laughs> that's, that's the thing. That's the thing with my friend is she has incredible game, and until I saw it in for first, I always thought she was like just telling tall tales or whatever. No, she's got some serious game, and and so it's just one of those things where I mean, like, yeah, it, it made sense when people said it. I never thought about it, and it, like it's just I, again, I was it, I was never sensitive. To pick up on those cues, it was kind of like I was the hapless idiot. So, and it's 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 sort of interesting to me that because um, my 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 experience of coming out, my view on coming out is like the complete opposite. When someone mm -hmm. uh, when it when a actually that when a straight person tells me that someone else is queer, um, my my typical practice is to completely disregard what they're saying yep. until that person actually. 
tells me or does something to indicate that. Like, have a, you know, Come a partner party. or something like that. <laughs> um, and it's interesting that co- coming out can can change the way your existing relationships work. J. Rachel Edidin, uh wrote a really good article on how when they came out uh, as trans, um, they their husband went from being in a straight relationship to being in a queer relationship. And so they have, by coming out, not just changed sort of how the world perceives them, but the, the nature of the relationship that they are in. Uh, they wrote it just after Orlando, so it was it's in that context. I'll link it in the show notes because it was really good. Um, you should also check out Jay and Miles' podcast because it's amazing. Uh, which I will also link in the show notes because I like the show notes. <laughs> but, uh, no, like, like my assumption when someone comes out to me is that they have always known. And that they have always, like consistently forever, um, been struggling with that. And that is equally usually not true. Um... But I find that it's, it's in, in many senses, I think, the, the more charitable position. Um, and it makes, in my head, uh, it makes coming out, I think, the big deal that it is. Because coming out isn't something you do once. Coming out is something you do in, like, fits and starts. Whether it's to friends to family to co-workers to to possibly the government Mm -hmm. um whether that's through transitioning or through um you know married like getting married under marriage equality and things like that like like it is a huge thing and it is something that you may have to do more than once Um, To the same people, if things sort of shift, which they do. Uh, Sexuality is fluid. Gender is fluid. Uh, Monogamy and things like that are fluid. Uh, And different sort of axes along those spectrums will often meet different kinds of resistance with different kinds of people. Oh, yes. So, I mean, there are lots of people who are happy to accept that someone is gay, but they find it deeply unsettling that that person might be poly. Oh, that one always... I... 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 Oh, it's like I had... had Man, it's talking. almost like I thought you would have some thoughts about this, Theo. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one always makes me feel like I'm biting my head off a wall when I think about it. I'm like, what? oh, people are... Yeah, people. I, it's and and I don't know. I compartmentalize this notion that they have not come out; they have just come out to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and that you know, it's the same thing. So, to put that in context, uh, I was part uh, very briefly uh, in the university. I I was part of uh, Glow, which is Gays and Lesbians of Waterloo, and it inclu- it's an inclusive sort of group. Um, that encompasses, you know, all spectrums of sexuality and gender, and um, although that what they are called as gays and lesbians, because it, abbre- it, it abbreviates to something really cool. Yeah. And um, going to their meetings, they, they had this really incredible safe space where people could talk about things that, like pressures they were under and things like that, everything from school to relationships to work to family. Um. But the cardinal rule of GLOW was if you see someone that you know from GLOW outside the walls of that meeting, Mm -hmm. you do not acknowledge their existence. You do not tell them, you know, like, like you don't say hi to them, you don't tell them how the meeting went, if they missed it, like... Because you don't know who's out, and more importantly, you don't know who's out to whom. Yeah. And even if I am out, by being out around people, I can out them. Yeah. And you never, ever, ever out anybody. <sighs> that, if, gets, that gets you put on a list. That gets you put on a list. If there is one thing to take away from this podcast, never, ever out anybody because it feels 
awful. Yep. And super dangerous. Yes. Like, super in many dangerous. contexts, it is dangerous. Uh, whether that's um, everything from people getting fired to people getting murdered. Yep. Like, it is a real danger pretty much everywhere in the world. <laughs> Ooh, take a moment. Do you want to talk about coming out to you? Oh God, coming out. Oh well, yeah. Now you're talking about being outed. Um, yeah. I this is. I'll do the trans ones for a bit. Slightly less to talk about. Um, I'm out to several friends in real life, and because my parents don't understand how computers work, I can be kind of out on Twitter. I'm I am out to people I know there, and like people I choose to be out to there. And now people who listen to this podcast. And people listen to this podcast. I'm I'm perfectly happy with that because people who listen to this podcast are pretty rad, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> um. Yeah, and like that coming out. That was more. That one more involved. Like I came out to people, and I was still using a shortened version of my dead name at the time. Mm-hmm. So that was just people going, okay, so not she, it's he instead, and that that people seemed to be okay with that. People were kind of yeah, okay, cool, whatever. Um, I went into Bristol Con last year. And they'd made me a spe- I had a minion badge. I'm one of the minions there. And then mm-hmm. they specifically put my pronouns on my badge for me. Just to make sure, sure people got it right. Cool. Which was nice of them. Um, for more information on dead naming, check out the show notes. Yes. Um, and then it got to the stage of... Like, the swore stuff. I was really, I knew, now I knew it was just swore stuff. And it was really bad. And the, using the shortened version of my dead name wasn't helping. So I was like, I need, to, I need to change this name. I can't use this name anymore. Mm-hmm. That bit was a tricky bit. Some people kind of slipped up a couple of times. Like, not so much on Twitter, because you can kind of see it in the name, but, like, in real life, a couple of times people would sort of accidentally come with their own name. And I wouldn't get upset with people, because I understand it's not the easiest thing to do, because I've been never named for 20-odd years, and suddenly it's like, no, boom, this name. But that one's actually gone... To the people I'm out to, has gone kind of smoothly. I had one person... Um, tell me I needed mental help and she'd probably be in an institution and I no longer speak to that person. Um, which is kind of sad because it's someone who I was very close to for a long time but I'm like, I don't need people like that in my life. Mm-hmm. But when I, yeah, back when I was a teenager, I was still in high school. No, don't come out in high school. God. People in high school are awful. Um, I came out to my friend Alex, who's my close friend, and my small group of friends. And then because I'd had an argument with one of them one day, they went out with me to my year group. Ooh. That resulted in me getting chased in the bathroom and beaten up. Um, I had a couple of people threaten me with things. Um, I spent like a month, I had to spend like lunchtime and stuff in like the guidance teacher's offices because it was the only safe place I could be. Mm-hmm. Um, my little sister got threats from people about it. It was before she came out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my sister's quite happily out as a lesbian. That was a, and then I got threats because she was out, and then people went, well, "You're queer too. What what the hell is wrong with your family?" Um, but yeah, like I and then I, the one the most heartbreaking bit of all was my cousin Lewis, the one you didn't meet unfortunately. He came to me one day at my family party, and he was just like, we we're just sitting quietly talking somewhere, and he was like, "Somebody at school said this about you." He's like, "I'm really worried about you because I don't want you to get hurt, but I want you to be you." And I was just, I I burst into tears. He went, "Oh shit, it's real, isn't it?" I was like, "Ah, oh, thank you for that." <laughs> but um. Yeah, like, I'm sort of, I'm actually surprised my parents don't bring it up more often because I'm quite obviously queer. I don't really try and hide that as such. But when coming out was fucking scary. Like, the first time you do it is terrifying. Like I said, you were the first person I came out to as trans. I spent the day before crying because I was so scared about telling... I don't know why I was scared of telling you of all people. But I was so scared to tell anyone... like. T- t- totally different to come out with sexuality coming out. I was fine with that. I was quite happy to put that for some reason. But I just couldn't do this one. It was so scary. And I think because it's such a shift in perspective. Like you were saying before, like, you suddenly think of someone in a completely different way. And this one was a shift in perspective of people. But I am very lucky and the people I've told have been really good about it. But yeah, like, being out, like, I, I have been very careful who I've told about being trans in real life. Because, like, where I work, I can't be out. Not just because there's some really awful people I work with, but just the service users, and that, it's a thing we wouldn't get their heads around or whatever. Um, it's really funny because I'm out to cat at work, and like 
she's not called Kat at work and there's like we have a whole like a whole code we talk in at work going on it's really ridiculous but yeah no it's oh it's making that decision to actually come out is really difficult as well it's like knowing when to tell people because mm-hmm. it's like like I was I attempted to come out to my parents before you guys got here because you guys know me as Theo I'm not out to my parents so we just spent two weeks of you guys calling me Teddy and whatever else and my parents being completely oblivious to it which was quite amazing actually but you can tell there's things people say and attitudes people have towards things it makes it really difficult to tell them these things like my little sister she doesn't mind me telling a story I know she doesn't mind me telling a story when she, she came out to me at 14 she got to my parents at 16 and she'd arranged to go and stay at a friend's house and live there if she had to because she was so scared my parents would kick her out because of the things my dad would say. Mm-hmm. Most specifically my dad. Not so much my mum, but my dad. And the actions he had. And she was so terrified. And, like, she came storming upstairs because all he did, like, she eventually got him to mute the TV and listen to her. That was the biggest fight. She told him, like, oh, cool, we'll turn the TV back on. She came upstairs screaming. I had to go and sit with her for half an hour and, like, calm her down because she was so angry at him because the way he... He just treat like, okay, cool, whatever. And she's like, no, this is actually a big deal right now. And it took her another, like, six weeks to get him to actually listen to how much of a big deal it was that's coming out. Because he's like, yeah, I, he, I knew you were gay because of stereotypical, horrible reasons. Like, she was tomboyish, so she had to be gay. It was like, I was tomboyish and I'm not gay. Like, you know. You know. And, oh, it's just, fight, those attitudes make it very difficult to come out. And, and unsafe to come out in some cases. Like, I don't know how my parents would react to me telling them I'm trans. And right now, I can't afford to live anywhere else, and I can't afford to sort of have that insecurity of not having a job or anything like that. So I have to be very careful with who I tell. And it's horrible. You know, I, I, right now, coming out to everyone would be the most freeing thing I could do, and I, it's the one thing I can't do. And it's, yeah, it's a whole... Yeah, coming out feels awful. Yeah. It's like, um. I felt, when I first came out, I felt like I'd been lying to everyone for years. Like I'd been purposely lying to people and was now having to fess up. And people were like, you've not been lying, you just you didn't know this information about yourself yet, now you're sharing it. I'm like, no, I feel like I've been lying for years. Mm. I feel like I've been wearing this mask and not telling you who I really am, and that's an awful thing to do. But, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole fucking thing in there. We could be here for hours talking about this. Oh my. <laughs> we should create a, a separate playlist. On it's the just YouTube me channel yelling at a camera. Of, of, of the various oh. <laughs> bits of this thread so you can watch them all together. Yeah, well, we will uh, We will include some other links in the show notes for mm-hmm. resources. Yeah. Both on um, videos and, and, and resources on coming out. Um, as well as how to support people who are coming out. Mm-hmm. Because I think I think your description of your of, of your sister's experience is accurate. Like like it is hard I think to understand how big a deal it is, yeah. and the kind of uh, the kinds of of like people get killed over this shit. Mm-hmm. Um and and not people in far off countries, you know that we don't like to talk about. People who live in my town. Yeah get killed over this shit. You do find out some interesting thing about other people when you come out as well. Like We find out from my grand. You met my grand. I met your grand. She's amazing. My grand's lovely. Um, my sister came out to my grand about a year after my parents because she was with her then fiancé to be wife who's now divorced from that's the whole thing as well. But she wanted to tell my grand because she wanted to invite my grand to the wedding. Mm-hmm. And she'd gone through and she sort of said to my grand, well, you know, I'm, I'm gay. And my grand went, cool, I'm happy. To which it turned out my little sister didn't understand that gay was no word for happy. But my grand's way of doing it was to talk to Tegan Mickey a little bit. She went, no, no, it's cool, I understand, I understand. And it turns out, way back in like the 50s when it was not okay to be gay, my grand knew this, this, this gay couple and like they were obviously closeted, but she knew they were a gay couple because she got to know them quite well. And my grand was like, well, how can I help these people? Just sort of being a nice, a good, a good friend at the time. And it turned out these guys were like going to like the tea dances and stuff they had. Mm-hmm. And my grandpa couldn't go because he'd been in a mine accident and damaged his hip really badly. He just it wasn't interested in dancing. It was his scene. And my grand's friend Janet, who she always went around with, her husband Huey, 
just what he wasn't interested in dancing. He'd ride with my granny, go and sit in the pub and have a pint. So my gran and Janet would be the dates for these two guys. So they could go dancing, and these guys could go out on a date, and then no one wouldn't be out with anyone because my gran and Janet That's were there with them. And my grand's like, yeah, like they were good people. I wasn't going to turn around and tell them, no, you don't right to exist, because like, like they were really nice guys. And I got to go dancing, so win win. <laughs> and I was just like, and it like I don't know why I never like I never really thought thought of my grand of all people, being the one who as a be, beard. No one who'd be so cool with all, but she's <laughs> like, yeah, people are people. As long as you don't hurt me, don't hurt animals, you're fine. I'm like, thanks, grand. <laughs> but yeah, my grand was a total beard, and I love it. Nice, Huck. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, we did not, by the way, we did not discuss any of this stuff in the pre-show. Nope. Yeah, a lot of this was, a lot of this, as you said, you wanted to come out. Come we didn't want cold. to spoil you. Um, yeah, I want to color your, your thoughts. I don't know, I guess, um, as a, uh, so, what, third, fourth day, maybe, when we all met for the queerkening? Queerkening? The queerkening <laughs> was, no, it was like a week into the thing. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, however, like, it was, it was last week, let's say. Um, so as the only straight person that's sitting at the table, I guess... Eight queers. Yeah, eight, eight queer folk. No, seven queer folk and you. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was the eighth person. Um, like, I didn't know what to expect, and I didn't know if I was gonna be treated with, um, hostility is the wrong word, but, like, I guess it's similar to a, a story that you were telling, I think, in the pre-show of, like... Mm. Um, I was there invading the space and I wasn't welcome only in so far as like I was inserting myself, even though I knew I was, I was, I was yeah. explicitly invited, yeah. right? But I was a little leery go- coming into it in terms of whether or not I would get the side eye because I was the outsider sitting in, in somebody else's space. Um, and so the only real way I reconciled that going in, which I should preface this all by saying like, I didn't have to worry about anything because everybody was really cool. (laughs) But the way I kind of went into it is just like, okay, keep your mouth shut, keep your ears open, you know, learn and adapt on the fly. And Mm -hmm. the biggest thing I found actually was really helpful because for the first half is the wrong word, but I I split it in in the halves. I I kept my mouth shut only because um, I I don't do well in meeting a lot of new people all at once. I'm very good one-on-one, but I'm terrible at... Like, paying attention to everything going on around me, right? And the first little bit of the the, the interaction was uh, things like shipping and online culture. Things that I don't participate in, right? <laughs> so, what really helped me was when I finally, like, with Nikki and Ollie, finally found a different avenue to connect with them. And we talked about things that... I actually had experience in. Was it Power Rangers? Please tell me it was I don't Power remember, Rangers. I don't remember what the actual... <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Nikki was involved. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what the first the first little bit of it turned out to be. But it wasn't until I basically turned to them beside me and started talking to them rather than trying to participate in somebody else's conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't I don't participate in shipping culture online. I don't, I don't really do that. Like, that's not something that I'm into, right? And so you're talking about it, and you're talking about what, what was that? That famously so bad it's good. Oh story. crap! Um, uh, the Evanescence reference. The one they took down. The, My immortal. My, My immortal, immortal, right? Yes. Right? Like they're talking about it, and I had to a couple times be like, "Okay, time out. Can you just explain this to me? Because I, it's it, it's an Evanescence song to me. That's all I have." <laughs> Right? So, I mean, the, as long as you ask respectful questions or re- ask for a respectful context kind of deal, like that helps. But uh, I found it was incredibly helpful to just relate to the individual on, on a kind of common ground. And then, then it was fine. And then we got into playing D&D and that was, that was different, right? Shockingly, queer people, also people. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. But this has been quite a podcast. That's I'm excited. Oh, so. Now we got to go pack. Yes. Speaking of unpacking a bunch of stuff, <laughs> now it's time to go pack it all back up. Fact. Oh, God. Oh, it's late. Get, I don't get to be queer tomorrow. I got to put my non-queer face back on. Wow. Sad face. <sighs> and with that, <laughs> I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. We're signing off. Stay awesome. And stay safe. Stay safe. And please keep people safe. Look how few fucks I give. This, there's fewer fucks per square inch. Yeah, because it's so small. The FSI measurement in a, in a middle finger is very important. <laughs> like, or are there just as many fucks, but they're under pressure? 
That, yeah. He's like, like, to explode. At any point, just fucks could pour out of it. 